Southern Fried True Crime covers cases that are not suitable for young listeners, and there may also be some explicit language used. Listener discretion is advised. Today's episode is about a 1989 murder case I'm surprised I had never heard of, because the press had a field day with it. The Charleston Sun Sentinel called this crime a poignantly real-life, awkwardly close-to-home production of a script Tennessee Williams never got around to. The Washington Post ran a piece of Southern Gothic soap opera about the murder called The Delta Prince and His Doomed Princess. There is a Lifetime movie loosely based on the case, but the names are changed and the location is moved from Mississippi to Texas. And as with a lot of cases that are so romanticized in the media, the villain and victim are projected into a tragic love story, losing sight of the cold hard fact that a young woman was murdered. And it was her ex-husband, Ralph Han III, son of a prominent Delta family, who had killed her. Olivia Browning was not the daughter of a rich planner. She wasn't socially or politically connected the way her ex-husband was. But she was a very beautiful woman, high-spirited and smart, the kind of woman people love to portray as a femme fatale, charming and seductive, the kind of Southern beauty that a man just can't quit. But the same could be said of Olivia, as she always went back to Ralph. They had that kind of passionate and toxic relationship that was always volatile, and yet they couldn't stay away from each other. They were divorced, but living together at the time of Olivia's murder. Many murder cases are tried in the press first, and in this case, Olivia Browning, the victim, was smeared in the press. And it would seem that the Hand family's media campaign and political connections heavily influenced the justice served in this case. Welcome to episode 118, The Murder of Olivia Browning. Olivia Browning's murder happened on land owned by her ex-husband's family in a tiny town in the Mississippi Delta. The Delta is often called the most southern place on earth. It can be a dubious distinction based on racial and cultural history. Geographically, the Delta is in the northwest section of Mississippi and parts of Arkansas and Louisiana, lying between the Mississippi and Yazoo Rivers. It's almost 7,000 square miles of alluvial floodplain, meaning the soil is rich and fertile. It was originally covered in hardwood forests across the bottomlands when white settlers moved there before the Civil War. Before that, Choctaw Native Americans lived in the area. They were forced from the land during the Indian Removal Act of 1830, eventually settling in the Oklahoma Territory. White settlers who came to the Mississippi Delta developed the land for cotton. Wealthy planters moved in and built successful plantations on the backs of thousands of enslaved Africans. In fact, there were twice as many black people than whites in the population at that time. And after the Civil War, Black people continued to be disenfranchised in many Delta counties, where whites were often violently resistant to change. Many black people left the area in the Great Migration, beginning in 1916. But many stayed and their roles evolved along with technology. The Delta is home to several genres of music, including Delta blues and rock and roll. Black sharecroppers and tenant farmers expressed their poverty and hardships in music that reflected their unique beats and rhythm, shaping the music in that area of the nation, much like how enslaved blacks influenced the jazz music born in New Orleans. Today, the small town of Glendora, where Ralph Hand's family had ruled, is now predominantly black. The population has never risen over 200 people. Ralph Thomas Hand III was born on October 19, 1958, in Greenwood, Mississippi, about 20 minutes from Glendora. His parents were Ralph Hand Jr. and Elizabeth Peacock Sturdivant Hand. Ralph grew up in a very prominent plantation family. Ralph Hand Jr., better known as Big Ralph, was not a Southern boy from birth. He grew up in New Jersey and attended Dartmouth. After Big Ralph married Elizabeth, 
whose family was, according to the Atlanta Journal, known for its political moderation in the deeply conservative Delta. The couple moved to Elizabeth's family's plantation, Good Luck, in Glendora, Tallahatchie County, Mississippi. There, they managed the plantation and raised their four kids in a brick mansion located in a grove of pecan trees. Tallahatchie County was founded in 1833 and named for a Choctaw word meaning river of rocks. The Good Luck Plantation's 3,000 acres were used to grow cotton and soybeans. According to the Washington Post, Big Ralph was known to treat his workers better than other plantation owners. He paid his workers more and generously loaned money without asking questions, simply deducting fair payments from their paychecks. One anonymous plantation employee told the Atlanta Journal, quote, Big Ralph didn't do you like other white folks did. And later, when Little Ralph began helping with management of the plantation, he was said to be as kind and generous as his father. A former tractor driver, Joe McTee, told the Washington Post, quote, When my house burned down, out of all the millionaires here, nobody offered me any help except Little Ralph. He brought me a check and said he was hurt about it and that he wished he could do more. He also said, I couldn't be on no jury. Big Ralph became a prominent agricultural figure, not only in Tallahatchie County, but all across the Delta. He served as president of the Delta Council, a council whose members lobby for Delta plantation interests. He was king of the Cotton Ball in 1984, district governor of the Lions Club, on the board of the Tallahatchie County Hospital, executive vice president of the Southern Plantationers Regional Plantation Cooperative, and much more. It wasn't just Big Ralph who was successful. His brother-in-law, Mike Sturdivant, Elizabeth's brother, was well-known in the community and even ran for governor twice. The DeSoto Times-Tribune called him the best man never elected governor. He was tech-savvy and was also said to be courageous about civil rights in an area that resisted it. Beth Sturdivant Han passed away from cancer in 1974. Fifteen-year-old Little Ralph took her death hard, but according to friends, he was stoic. Big Ralph married a woman named Edie two years later. Little Ralph, who I will just refer to as Ralph from here on out, seemed to like his stepmom, buying her Mother's Day cards, and he also had three new step-siblings to go with his three sisters. I imagine it was a lively household. Ralph attended Pillow Academy, where he was valedictorian, class officer, and a star tennis player. He was known to be friendly and easygoing. His friends said he was popular, but he wasn't a snob. He was attractive, with thick reddish blonde hair and pale blue eyes. Friends told newspapers that Ralph was one of those guys who made friends with everyone. He didn't gossip or badmouth people, and they insisted that he did not have a temper. After graduating from Pillow Academy, Ralph went to the University of Mississippi, known as Ole Miss, and pledged Phi Delta Theta. Ralph's plan was to study business, then help his father run the plantation. He had three sisters, but it was always known that Ralph was the heir to the hand plantation. But Ralph's life changed forever on October 30th, 1976, while a freshman at Ole Miss. Ralph and his then girlfriend, Elizabeth, drove to New Orleans after an Ole Miss Louisiana State football game in Baton Rouge. Ralph, who had been drinking, drove the wrong way up a highway ramp and hit an oncoming car. Ralph suffered a ruptured aorta and was left paralyzed from the waist down. Elizabeth was injured as well, needing extensive plastic surgery to repair the cuts on her face. The driver of the other car luckily only suffered a broken leg. Ralph was told he would need to use a wheelchair to get around, but he lifted weights and built up his upper body strength so that he could use a walker. He would push, pull, and drag himself with the walker. He withdrew from Ole Miss in November of 1976, right after the accident, and then went back to school in the summer of 1977. But in the summer of 1982, Ralph left the university a few credits short of graduating, 
and started managing the family plantation, as was always the plan for him. He met a woman named Olivia Nelson Browning through friends. Friends, and even Olivia's family, would later point out that she was not in the same social class as Ralph. She was a postmaster's daughter. He was the son of a wealthy plantation owner. And this is the narrative that would later drive this case in the media. Many publications might not say it outright, but the implication was that Olivia was poor white trash, which is shitty, not to mention inaccurate. She might not have been the daughter of a wealthy plantation owner, but it's not like she came from poverty. She went to private school for crying out loud and later college. Although one article felt the need to point out that her family home was located next to a used tire store. To me, that just means she was town, not country. But you can see the subtle classism. Ralph meeting Olivia Browning was a huge turning point in his life. He fell for her hard and would stop at nothing to be with her. She lifted his spirits and seemed to help restore his self-confidence after his paralysis. Olivia Browning wasn't just attractive, she was charismatic. She was described in the Atlanta Journal as, quote, so beautiful and beguiling that a lot of people were in love with her. Olivia Nelson Browning was born on April 8, 1956, to parents Nelson and Jimmy. Nelson was the city of Tutwiler's postmaster, and Miss Jimmy was a homemaker. Olivia's family was, according to newspapers, highly liked and respected in the small town of Tutwiler, about 20 minutes from where Ralph lived in Glendora. Olivia had gorgeous blonde hair, thick and long, parted in the middle as was the style at the time. She was petite and very pretty. Like Ralph, she was very popular in school and also smart. Olivia's older sister, Rebecca, said Olivia was a talented writer with a wonderful sense of humor and a love of life. According to the Washington Post, Olivia's gossipy friends said she was, quote, a rebel bell, spurning her debut, yet definitely wouldn't date anybody without money. When public schools were integrated, Olivia's parents transferred her to the all-white Delta Academy. She later went to Delta State University in Cleveland, Mississippi, for a year. While there, she was in the Kappa Delta sorority and served as the press chairman. Olivia then transferred to the Mississippi University for Women in Columbus, Mississippi. While there, Olivia was a member and vice president of Sigma Delta Chi. She was also a member of the press club, as well as a reporter and editor for the student newspaper. Olivia Browning was clearly an overachiever, but she also had a lot of fun. She drove a blue Volkswagen Bug and loved to take off for the beach with her friends. In 1979, Olivia graduated from MUW with a bachelor's degree in journalism. After college, she wanted to work as a reporter, and she worked at a couple of radio and TV stations, but didn't seem to get far. She also worked for a land developer in Greenwood for a short time, and her obituary also said she was a former school teacher. Not long after college, Olivia found out she couldn't have children. She had a gynecological problem, which required surgery. Doctors gave her the bad news afterwards. She was extremely disappointed. Olivia had really wanted children. Olivia was briefly married to a former Ole Miss football player. After the marriage ended, Olivia moved home. Despite other gossip about Olivia's life, I didn't see much about her first husband. On December 15, 1984, Olivia married Ralph Hand III at a small Methodist church in Glendora. It was said to be a family wedding and that Olivia showed up 45 minutes late without explanation. But according to at least one friend who was supposedly in attendance, she, quote, just grabbed Ralph's arm and marched down the aisle. After they returned from their honeymoon in Acapulco, Ralph and Olivia worked on the plantation. They would ride a four-wheeler together between rows, supervising cotton pickers. 
In their free time, the couple mostly just hung out together. They'd often ride around in Ralph's sports car all night. But after only 13 months of marriage, on January 24, 1986, Olivia and Ralph divorced. Olivia sued Ralph for habitual, cruel, and inhuman treatment. Ralph was ordered by a judge to pay Olivia a lump sum of $15,000, but she was not awarded alimony. Much to their family's dismay, the couple could not stay away from each other. Around a year after their divorce, Olivia and Ralph started dating again. Big Ralph did everything he could to keep them apart. He would kick Olivia off the property, but then Ralph would just meet her at a motel. At one point, Ralph and Olivia were secretly camped out on the property, bathing in the river. When Big Ralph found out, he offered Olivia a large sum of money to leave. He reportedly told his son, quote, either she's going to leave or you're both going to have to leave. It didn't work. Eventually, Olivia moved back into Ralph's house, which Big Ralph had built for him behind the plantation's main house. A garage owner and supposed friend of the couple named Pat Deadlake claimed that Olivia drove up one day with a drink in her hand and told him, quote, No one's going to run me off this time. Big Ralph's not going to make me leave. They're going to have to kill me to make me leave. Of course, this is quite the dramatic quote. Certainly the kind to get a mechanic who wasn't related to the family into the Atlanta Journal newspaper. They even ran his photo next to his quotes about Olivia and Ralph. And Olivia wasn't around to dispute this story or any of the rumors about her spread after her death. People said in the last seven months of Olivia's life, the couple had become more reclusive. Friends told the press that they had rarely been seen. Pat Didlake said they were kind of in their own personal world. The rumors were that the couple drank a lot and fought constantly. One friend said they mistreated each other. After one fight, there was broken glass from one end of the house to the other. On November 21, 1989, a man named Alvin Winters was hunting for deer in an area owned by the Han family known as Lay Place. It's around one and a half miles west of U.S. Highway 49 East. At around 4.50 p.m. in an isolated wooded area, he found a fire. After he saw the fire, he went to check it out. Horrified, he found a burning body. He left and went to the local jail to find help. Tallahatchie County Coroner Larry Tucker examined the body at the scene. He said it was burned beyond recognition. The body was that of a white female with brownish blonde hair wearing blue jeans, a sweater, and tennis shoes. There was a silver barrette in her hair, but no identifying jewelry. The coroner said she was between 25 to 35 years old, 5 foot 2 to 5 foot 4, and between 100 and 120 pounds. Olivia Browning had been a petite woman in life, and her long hair was often pinned back with a barrette. An autopsy showed that the woman had been shot once through the left eye with a twenty two caliber rifle, and then doused with diesel fuel and set on fire. Two or three of her ribs were broken on the left side of her body, but it was unclear if it was from a beating or from the fire. There were no powder burns on the body, which suggested that the shot was fired from more than two feet away. The way the bullet entered the eye meant whoever shot her had to have been below her, firing up. The sheriff's investigators believed that the body was Olivia Nelson Browning. So did Olivia's family. They said, we don't know where she is. She's missing. We feel sure it's Olivia. All we're doing is guessing. On the same day the body was found, two hand plantation workers told police they saw Ralph in the area where the body was discovered at around 4 p.m. that day. Ralph was driving a Ford Ranger truck when he got it stuck in the mud in a field next to the one where the body was found. Only a row of trees divided the two fields. The workers helped Ralph get the truck out of the mud. 
They said that Ralph's truck was the only one they saw in the area that afternoon. The sheriff finally decided investigators needed to speak to Olivia's ex-husband, Ralph Hand. When Sheriff's Deputy Henry Gibson was still talking to the plantation workers, he got a call that Ralph was gassing up his Datsun 240Z sports car. Deputy Gibson actually passed Ralph on the road. Gibson turned around and followed Ralph back to the plantation house. The deputy walked up to Ralph as he was still seated in his car. He told Ralph they needed him to come to the station to talk about an accident that happened on the hand property. Deputy Gibson noticed Ralph was shaking and had blood on his pants. He asked Ralph had he been deer hunting that day, and Ralph said no, but then sped away. Gibson hopped in his car and chased after Ralph. But Ralph kept driving, and quickly, a full-on high-speed chase ensued. Around 20 to 30 patrol cars from multiple departments and counties were involved in the chase. It lasted for 30 to 45 minutes, according to different reports, and officers said at some points during the chase, Ralph drove over 100 miles per hour. He was even able to evade multiple roadblocks. North of the town of Sunnyside on US 49 East, police set up another roadblock, this time with their patrol cars. Deputy Gibson fired three shots at Ralph's car as he drove into the roadblock, almost running over two officers. Ralph rammed into Gibson's patrol car, then crashed into a ditch. The officers ran over to his car and pulled him out and arrested him. As they cuffed him, Ralph begged the police to kill him. He allegedly said, quote, Please kill me. Women will make you do funny things, like the one I had. The deputies all saw that Ralph had bloodstains on his pants. In his pockets, they found a spent twenty-two shell. In his car, police found a few unused twenty-two shells, as well as a pair of gold earrings and a gold Gucci watch, which was later identified as belonging to Olivia. They also found Ralph's walker in the back of the car, and it had blood on it. That day, he was charged with reckless driving and speeding. The following day, 31-year-old Ralph was charged with capital murder after the state theorized that Ralph's motive for killing Olivia was robbing her of her earrings and watch. Under Mississippi law, capital murder is defined as the killing of a person during the commission of another felony, such as robbery. If he was found guilty of capital murder, Ralph would be eligible for the death penalty and he was denied bail. I think it's pretty obvious that the wealthy son of a plantation owner did not kill his ex-wife to steal her jewelry. He was trying to hide her identity when he burned her body. But you can't burn up a gold Gucci watch. This was really a way for the DA to charge Ralph Hand with a capital murder and hold him without bond while they investigated the murder. Deputies searched Ralph's home and found blood in the carport near the kitchen door, around the door frame, and on the kitchen floor near the door. It looked like someone had tried to clean up the blood. They also found two 22 caliber rifles and a 38 caliber pistol. In the living room were boxes and a suitcase packed with women's clothing. It would seem Olivia had recently packed up her things. Maybe the couple had been fighting and she decided to leave. At this point, investigators had been able to match tire tracks leading away from the burning body to the tires on Ralph's truck. Four days after the murder, through fingerprints, it was confirmed that the burned body was that of 33-year-old Olivia Nelson Browning. It was also confirmed that the 22 found in Ralph's kitchen was the gun used to kill Olivia. After finding out who the killer was, Olivia's sister, Rebecca, said the family didn't want revenge, but expected justice. She said, quote, that's hard to get in Tallahatchie County. She wasn't wrong, even about the Delta in general. Earlier that year, another wealthy Delta planter named David Manker was acquitted after shooting his wife dead. And Rebecca was right about Tallahatchie. 
it was hard for Olivia to get justice in the small county. A lot of rumors about Olivia and Ralph's relationship started circulating. Their relationship was described as boozy and passionate. Some said Olivia was an abusive partner, while Ralph was the real victim. Others said that was far from the truth. Olivia was scared of Ralph, who was the abuser. But there were many stories circulating about Olivia abusing Ralph. The rumors were about how Olivia would take Ralph's walker and throw it out the door. Ralph would then have to call a plantation worker to help him. Another rumor was that Olivia threw Ralph's walker in the yard and made him crawl to get it. As he crawled, Olivia allegedly hit Ralph with a broom handle. One worker, a man named Sweeney Martin, said Olivia, quote, whipped his butt many times. Ralph would call Sweeney late at night and ask for help. Sweeney would ask him, why don't you let her go? And Ralph would say, I can't. I love her. One plantation worker said she saw scars on Ralph's body. Ralph would try to cover his scars so Big Ralph wouldn't see them. He'd wear high shirt collars or sunglasses. That mechanic friend, Pat Didlake, told the Washington Post that when Olivia drank, she demeaned Ralph. He generously added, she wasn't a bitch, she just had an attitude. Grocery store owner A.D. Jones said that whenever the couple stopped at the store, she'd always be fussing, screaming, and cussing, raising cane with him. We felt sorry for him. I don't see how he lived with a person like that. A high school friend of Olivia's named Jay Gordon told the Washington Post, quote, Olivia brought out the worst in men. She wouldn't always do what they wanted her to do. She'd rip them up, break their hearts, get them where she wanted them, and drive them crazy. Or they'd drive themselves crazy over her. She had that effect. I know plenty like her. They're not femme fatales, just Mississippi women. Plantation workers alleged that Olivia would verbally abuse them. They said she would go into the fields drunk and slurring her words. They claimed Olivia cussed out the workers using racial slurs. One time, a worker, Eugene Rosebud, accidentally broke a tractor axle. He said that Olivia got in his face and said, You black son of a bitch, I'm not going to let you bankrupt Ralph. Another time, when Eugene was eating lunch, Olivia allegedly said, You better suck those chicken bones dry because that's the last meal you'll get around here. Eugene said he had finally had it. He threw his food across the field and walked away. He said he didn't want to be treated like a dog. Ed Lowe, Ralph's friend who had introduced him to Olivia, said, We're not going against Olivia, but people who want to stick to her side are going to have to back down when it comes to the truth. It's strange how someone can be viewed as a devil alive and an angel dead. I think it's very important to note that a lot of these ugly quotes about Olivia came from either hand family friends or employees of the plantation. Not to call anyone a liar, but they were all beholden to the powerful hand family in some way. I especially don't like the anonymous quotes. I certainly understand the importance of anonymity for sources in journalism. But I believe that the press particularly in that Washington Post piece, had plenty of dirt on Olivia Browning from named sources without piling on the rumors from people who wouldn't give their names. Those rumors would be put on display in newspapers, magazines, and TV all across the country. Olivia's sister Rebecca said, It's like reading about somebody you don't know. This is not Olivia. Olivia was a good, kind, sweet person. I know who she was. Other rumors point to a different reality. Olivia was the true victim and Ralph was abusive. Olivia's friends said she was trying to leave him after he beat her. Ralph's drinking was out of control and he begged Olivia to stay. She wanted to move back to her parents, but Ralph wouldn't let her. One of Olivia's friends, named Billy Austin Beard, told the Clarion Ledger, quote, I was around Olivia a lot, and if the rumors were true, I never knew about it. She went on to say, quote, I think she really loved him for who he was, but I just don't think they could live together. 
She would say, I'm not going back around him. And the next thing you knew, they were back together. Olivia told her family that Ralph had threatened and choked her. He also threatened to hurt her parents. Olivia's sister, Rebecca, said their parents had to go rescue Olivia so many times. They wanted her to stay away, she said, but they couldn't force her to stay away. Rebecca also sadly admitted that she had been estranged from her sister because of her abusive relationship with Ralph. She was tired of her sister constantly going back to this man who hurt her. Inside the boxes of stuff at Ralph's house, multiple letters written by Olivia were found. Olivia wrote a letter to Ralph that said, I was scared to death. As mad as you were, you would come after me in your car and shoot or wreck me. She said that she worried Ralph would kill himself with drugs and alcohol. Olivia wrote, I'm sorry I had to take your walker. She said she had to do it for self-defense. The following is a long quote Olivia wrote to Ralph. I never saw that I had a choice before because I loved you so much. I still do. The real you. The sober you. The drug-free you. But you are that person less and less. I cannot take the alcohol, coke, verbal and physical abuse, being ostracized and blamed and excluded and living in isolation. I cannot take sitting by and seeing you slowly and steadily kill yourself and what I feel for you. I cannot take the night sweats, sick talk, nosebleeds, self-imposed diarrhea, and throwing up ten times a day. Babe, do you realize the only time you aren't drinking is when you're asleep? That's why I used to love those first few hours in the morning, because you were just plain Ralph. Then the cocaine came into the picture and ruined that too. Even when you aren't on it, it's hell because you need it and feel sick. I am repulsed by the person you became because of that junk. You go berserk and threaten to kill me, throw things, grab me, etc. Don't you see that it's not you doing these things, it's that damn drug? After their divorce and before they got back together, Olivia wrote a letter to her teenage niece that she spent four years of hell with a man who couldn't handle his disability. She said, I've been choked, left stranded in strange cities with no money or place to stay, had a knife held to my throat. How do you defend yourself against a handicapped person? She wrote, quote, How do you leave a handicapped person when they change their tune and tell you how much they need and love you? Can you believe how nuts drugs made him? I hope it will be a lesson to you just how bad they can mess you up. He sure threw away everything and turned into a monster. Despite all the rumors of Olivia's abusive and violent nature, we have her own words, her handwriting identified, saying Ralph was a violent, alcoholic, and drug addict. She even admits to taking his walker, but she said it was in self-defense. It's not like she wrote these letters from the afterlife to defend herself. These were personal letters written to Ralph and her family, and they tell her side of the story. Ralph's family refused to comment on the rumors. Big Ralph told the Atlanta Journal, quote, Whatever dignity we have left, we want to try to keep it. Well, sure, it's easy to keep your dignity when you've got every friend and family member this side of the Mississippi calling Olivia everything but a damn dog to any journalist willing to print that crap. And actually, one prominent official did compare her to a dog. The first article I read about this case was the Washington Post article from 1990, written by Art Harris. I had to keep reminding myself that it was written over 30 years ago because it uses ableist language, calling Ralph a cripple. It is misogynistic and unapologetically classist, discussing the Southern breeding of certain social classes. The article is filled with Southern stereotypes and cliches and paints Olivia as a femme fatale, quite literally in one quote. Sure, they gave quotes on her side as well, but the lasting feeling you get is that Olivia Browning either got what she deserved or that this was some kind of tragic love story. The title of the article is The Delta Prince and His Doomed Princess. Ralph Hand was portrayed much more sympathetically. With many references to his paralysis, 
as he was also called a polite Southern gentleman. I was really disappointed. I was in high school in 1990, and I guess the passage of time, along with my own education and experience in writing, has made me forget that not too long ago, it was okay to denigrate a murder victim in this way. The Browning family was particularly offended by this article. Rebecca Sandridge, Olivia's sister, told the Charleston Sun that the story Harris wrote was, quote, a mudslinging campaign intent on assassinating a dead girl's reputation she'd worked for all her life and adding more grief to an already devastated family. The writer, Art Harris, told the Clarion Ledger at the time that he was writing a TV movie script about the murder based on his article. And in fact, he is the producer of a Lifetime movie about the case. I mentioned on social media that I watched the movie, and it very much followed the tone and theme of Harris's article. It is called, In the Name of Love, A Texas Tragedy. I'm guessing that the producers changed the names and location of the real crime to avoid a lawsuit from the Brownings, as the movie mostly supported the Han family's version of the events. In the first three minutes of that movie, the Olivia character is called White Trash. Seven minutes in, she's called a gold digger. And despite the few quotes in the Washington Post article from Olivia's friends and family, you can't tell me that article isn't slanted when the county coroner was bold enough to give this quote. The coroner, then 36-year-old Larry Tucker, said, quote, You get a lot of different opinions. Some say that some bitch had no right to kill nobody. Then you start hearing about how bad she was to him. A lot of boys here would probably think, By God, he's got every right to shoot her like a dog that run off. I think most people here think that way. Things haven't changed very much here since the 1800s. That's just the way it is, bud. I don't really care if that's just the way it is in your opinion, bud. As county coroner, this kind of comment in a major publication was highly inappropriate. And newspapers that didn't print rumors still set up a subtle dichotomy. Ralph is always called the son of a prominent planter in articles, while Olivia's beauty is always a talking point, sometimes more than her accomplishments, which is ironic since she actually finished college and Ralph didn't. Ralph's cousin, Sykes Sturdivant, told the Atlanta Journal, quote, If he had called up the sheriff and said, I murdered this woman, he would be on the streets today. People in Tallahatchie County would have no problem with it. The problem was burning the body and the chase. That's the feeling I get from talking to folks at the country club. I mean, this quote is really strange. It's Ralph's cousin. It's almost painfully true. But on the same token, it kind of sounds like he's lamenting Ralph's choices. Like, you know, if that old boy had just come clean, he wouldn't be in this pickle. Never mind the young woman he shot in the face before he burned her body. I can only imagine the courtroom drama that could have happened in this case. It would have been epic. Trashy Southern Gothic legal drama at its finest, with heavy accents thundering in the courtroom and a lot of gasping and pearl clutching in the audience. But that didn't happen because Ralph Hand III took a deal. On January 31st, 1992, Ralph pled guilty to manslaughter and aggravated assault on a police officer for ramming his car into that police roadblock in the high-speed chase he led. Ralph had taken a plea deal to get the capital murder charge downgraded to manslaughter. Ralph said he took a plea deal because he, quote, didn't want the families taxed through a trial. Another reason he supposedly took the deal was because in October of 1991, Ralph was hospitalized for an infection that came from an abscessed wisdom tooth. He was actually still in the hospital when he pled guilty. Yeah, sure. Maybe Ralph had realized that despite public opinion, he could have been facing the death penalty, or at least life in prison. Ralph was sentenced to 20 years for manslaughter, which was the maximum. He received 12 years for aggravated assault. The sentences would run concurrently. Ralph would be eligible for parole in around five years because he received credit for time served. Olivia's sister Rebecca and the family agreed to the plea deal 
because they didn't think the family would receive any real justice. Rebecca said, quote, Because of existing laws, I stopped thinking in terms of capital murder, murder, and manslaughter, and began only thinking how to get Ralph to Parchman and how many years he can be kept there. She said, quote, I knew it was best for me and my parents that Ralph Hand III's inconvenience end and his punishment begin. The Browning family sued Ralph in a $25 million wrongful death lawsuit. In 1994, they settled for an undisclosed amount. In a 1994 interview, Rebecca decided to come forward and reveal the pain Olivia's family had been through and discuss in more detail why they accepted the plea deal. The family had been under a gag order until their civil suit was settled, and now they could finally tell their side of the story. She said they had been worried about the appeals process lasting for years, and she also revealed a major factor to the Charleston Sun. She said, quote, My family wanted Ralph stripped of what we believe he held dearest, his financial security. She mentioned the wrongful death lawsuit in which her family took a settlement and said between that and his attorney's fees, Ralph Hand III could be assumed to be flat broke. Olivia's mother, Miss Jimmy, said, Ralph not only murdered Olivia, he took our lives. Our lives will never be the same. It doesn't get better because you realize, as time goes on, that Olivia will never come back, that we will never see her again in this life. During a deposition for the wrongful death lawsuit brought by Olivia's family, Ralph told his version of what happened on that fateful day. Ralph said Olivia was around 10 or 15 feet away from him in their house, threatening to hurt him with a hatchet. Ralph said, and that's when I grabbed the gun, and when I grabbed it, I had to grab it and catch it to get control of it, and when I caught it, it kind of hit the side of my walker, and that's when it discharged which would explain the upward trajectory of the bullet found at the autopsy. After the shooting, Ralph said he drove around drinking gin. He passed out, woke up, shaved, showered, then drove around drinking again. The next morning, he went to work for a bit. At around noon, he put the jewelry Olivia had been wearing in his pocket and drove her body to a secluded field, poured gas on it, and then burned it. The tire tracks near the body did match his Ford pickup. I don't believe this self-serving statement. He is basically saying it was an accident. The gun went off as he was trying to defend himself from Olivia. If that was true, then why didn't he call the sheriff? And I've got one more question. How did he move her body? Ralph was paralyzed from the waist down. We were certainly coached by the press to believe that Olivia took advantage of his disability and physically abused him. In fact, one of the stories was that she would take his walker away from him and make him pitifully crawl to it. This bugged me so much that I went back over all of the articles and could not find anything about how Ralph had moved her body. He never said himself, and no one ever speculated. I know that Ralph Hand was said to be a strong man, who built up his upper body strength in order to use a walker instead of a wheelchair. And maybe he did have a wheelchair at the house. Or maybe someone helped him move her body. I'm not accusing anyone, or even saying it's impossible that he moved her himself. But how he moved her body would seem to be an important part of this story. And we never get that answer. After the wrongful death civil suit was over, The Browning family talked about everything that had happened to them right after Olivia's murder. They said during the four days before Olivia's body was officially identified, the police kept denying that the body was Olivia's. Sheriff Donald Strider had gone on TV saying it was rumored that the body was Olivia's, but it wasn't confirmed. Everyone in town knew the body was Olivia's, but everyone kept calling the body a Jane Doe, which was agonizing to the Brownings. The family also said that until Olivia's body was positively identified, the Hand family did not talk to them at all. But 15 minutes after the body was identified, the Hand family attorney called the Brownings and said they wanted to make peace between the families. The Browning family also said Sheriff Strider 
tried to stop Olivia's funeral. Rebecca said he would not let the hearse leave for the cemetery. I got out of my car to see what he was doing, and he told me we could not take Olivia's body and bury her, that they needed to do DNA testing. She said she asked him, quote, what do you mean further testing? He said they needed to get in her bone marrow to get a blood sample and wanted us to take her to the funeral home. Rebecca told him they could have her body after the funeral. The police took Olivia's body after her funeral, and the DNA test took only 30 minutes. They had originally taken four days to identify her body by fingerprints, but then the police disrupted her funeral in a very disrespectful manner to run a test that could have been done in the original time it took to identify her body. The Browning family had to lay Olivia to rest after her funeral service was over. It was another slap in the face to a family who had suffered so much waiting for their daughter and sister to be identified so they could claim her body. The family also said that Ralph Hand got special treatment in the Tallahatchie County Jail while he awaited trial, almost two years before he took the plea deal. They said jail officials knocked out a wall to give him two cells. He had a fridge, carpet, exercise equipment, a TV, and beer in his cell. He was also free to roam the jail. Sheriff Strider said that the accusations of preferential treatment were damn lies and blamed the Browning family when he later lost his bid for re-election. Olivia's sister Rebecca said the national media failed her family. She said, quote, they painted a pitiful, helpless picture of the paraplegic while portraying Olivia as a violent, abusive woman. Well, by now, you know I completely agree. Art Harris wrote in that September 1990 Washington Post article, quote, There is much debate about who is the real victim, the beloved prince of plantation society, a gentle soul and benevolent boss by all accounts, or Olivia Browning, his deceased ex-wife, a postmaster's daughter of unpredictable temperament. No, Mr. Harris. The real victim is the dead woman, Olivia Browning. In 1996 and 1998, Ralph was denied parole due to community opposition and the serious nature of the offense. Ralph was released from prison after three well-known Delta legislators wrote letters supporting the release of Ralph to the parole board. The Clarion Ledger reported extensively on his controversial release. At this point, Ralph was pretty sick. He was very skinny and frail and was about to go on dialysis. The parole board said they released Ralph because of his poor health and his genuine sense of remorse. They also pointed out that manslaughter convicts are often paroled after five or six years. But the former district attorney in this case, Bobby Williams, said in no uncertain terms that he never believed it was manslaughter. He said that the supposed hatchet Ralph claimed Olivia was threatening him with was not found by the police. It was found days later by Ralph's attorneys. He said a self-defense claim would have been presented much earlier if it had had any credibility. And it did take two years to get the plea deal. Ultimately, he said at the time, he did what he thought was best for the Browning family who had suffered through all of the ugly press and two years of delays in bringing Ralph to trial. Big Ralph countered that since the prosecution accepted the manslaughter plea, there was, quote, much more to the situation than had been publicized. Olivia's family made it clear that they felt that his release after only seven years was due to Ralph's family's prominence and political connections. They said the parole board had been pressured. Ralph said that, if anything, his family name and connections kept him in prison longer because officials wanted to make an example of him. Parole board members admitted to the Clarion Ledger that they had voted to parole him 18 months before they actually did. They waited out of respect for the then two-term governor, Kirk Fortas, who had, quote, strenuously objected to Han's release. The governor had remarked that he had felt deeply hurt for the Browning family. 
a former parole board member was quoted as saying that Governor Fortas had promised the Browning family that Ralph would not be released during his administration. Ralph Hand was released the day after Governor Cork Fortas left office. Senator Bunky Huggins, who was chairman of the Senate Corrections Committee, told the Clarion Ledger that he voted to release Ralph Hand, while also admitting that he was friends with and attended church with the Hand and Sturtevant families. He gave a shocking comment to the paper, quote, I'll get in trouble for saying this, but the biggest talk around Greenwood was that it was just a matter of time before who killed who. It was a little more to it than what got into court records. Greenwood is the county seat in Mississippi. Huggins went on to say, quote, he never should have burned her. So even years after Olivia's murder, there are still hints from the Hand family and from well-connected politicians that Olivia was responsible for her own death and that really, Ralph's biggest mistake was burning her body. I suppose, in a way, they are right. If this prominent planner's son, the paralyzed prince of the plantations, had called the sheriff and said that his abusive ex-wife had come after him with a hatchet and he shot her in self-defense, he probably would not have spent more than a night in jail. Following his release, Ralph went back to work in the office for the plantations. However, his health continued to decline. In July of 2004, Ralph died of heart failure in his Glendora home. He was 45 years old. Ralph's friends and family had gone on a successful smear campaign for him. They actually said awful things about a woman who was shot and then had her body desecrated by fire by the man who supposedly loved her. After Olivia's murder, her sister Rebecca found a poem Olivia had written about Ralph. She found it tucked in behind a framed wedding photo of the once happy couple. It ominously evokes the fires of hell, a hell Olivia would have walked through for the man she loved so much. Quote, And if you're not there by judgment day, I'll know you went the other way. I'll give the angels back their wings, their golden harps, and other things. And just to show you what I'd do, I'd even go to hell for you. If there is a hell, I think Ralph Hand is burning there without Olivia by his side. Southern Fried True Crime is produced by me, Erica Kelly. Today's episode was researched and written by me and Haley Gray. The audio is edited and mixed by Ches Gray of Gray Multimedia. Southern Fried's original music is by Rob Harrison of Gamma Radio. And the original graphic art is by Coley Horner. Thank you to Jennifer Wood for suggesting this case. If you're not already a member, come join my Facebook group. While we do discuss crime, we also share memes and have a lot of laughs. Some members find it a place of comfort, a pleasant little corner of Facebook, as we have firm rules and our motto is no shit ass is allowed. We worship our patron saint, Dolly Parton, share recipes and personal stories and do our best to be good to one another. If you enjoyed today's show, don't forget to subscribe, and please tell a friend or rate and review on iTunes. I'm also on most large platforms like Stitcher and Spotify, as well as Stitcher Premium, where you can listen ad-free. If you have any case suggestions, please email southernfriedtruecrime at gmail.com. I do not accept case suggestions on social media private messages but please feel free to reach out by email. Not only do I get my most interesting and little-known cases from listener suggestions, I love hearing from you guys. Until next time, thanks so much for listening. Y'all take care. Mississippi.